All right, we're going live, baby. And here we are. For Exuvian Records, episode three. We got Jaden Carr. Hey, guys. How's it going? <laughs> what up, baby? So, for those who don't know, tell us, Jaden, who is Jaden Carr? Uh, Jaden Carr is some kid that was originally from Texas, uh, moved to Miami for eight years, and then moved back to Texas now. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the fun stuff. No, kidding. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I, I guess I'm the newest artist with Exuvium Records, so that's that's the fun thing, right? Hell yeah. And you just released your first song with us. Yes, Scarlet Rot, which uh, is kind of my twist on uh, some of the Elden Ring soundtrack, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah, we really... I mean, that's right down our alley. We love the cinematic stuff. We're obviously super inspired by games as uh, one one of many outlets. Oh, yeah. Especially with love... that aesthetic. Yeah, I mean, I Elden Ring. aesthetic. And it's... this tune is so awesome, too. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, top, it's top notch. We didn't give you any feedback whatsoever because we love the song. <laughs> and we're just like, yeah. yeah. I, I will say Scarlet Rot was kind of one of those tunes that just happened to be a, a happy accident. Um, it, I initially started it when Elden Ring first came out. I think it may have been probably a couple years ago. Um, and yeah, I just, I just thought it would be a cool idea to kind of see where I could take that idea. I really wasn't expecting anything of it. Um, but sometimes it's kind of like when you create your best music, I guess, is uh, when you're not expecting anything from it, you're just kind of writing just to write, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think when you like take the pressure off and you're just trying to do something for fun or to see if it works or experiment, mm -hmm. like that's when a lot of cool stuff happens. And like earlier, like an hour ago, Eric was playing... We made, like, this meme song with, like, a recording <laughs> yeah. of some dumb shit that our friend said. And Eric does this a lot, but we did this one together when he visited Denver one time. And, like, the song's actually fantastic. Like, <laughs> Dude, pretty much, like, a lot of my released music started out as just a meme song. And then, like, I'll change yeah. it into something serious later. It's, like... Yeah, it just takes off the pressure and lets you do something sometimes way different than you would normally as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, to quote the 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 legend Bob Ross, we only have happy <laughs> access here, you know? So <laughs> How did how did yeah, the, so, how did you start that song? Do you remember? Um Oh man, it it was a while ago, but I do remember kind of just starting out with the chords because, like, dude, when when you're in Elden Ring and you just like you know start the menu, uh, start from the menu, you press start, and then you just like hear this like riser come up out of nowhere and then it just like cuts off and then this epic choir just comes in, yeah. And I was like, Choirs. I have to start with that. Like that, there's something there with that idea, and I I just thought it was so cool. Um, and yeah, I, th I think I'll, I'll go over some of the production stuff probably like another day, but um, it was really cool to have that just initial buildup. And then in the second section of the song, Scarlet Rot, you kind of hear it like build up further than yeah. it did from the original theme. So I, I think it was like taking that idea, making it my own and kind of just putting my own spin on it, I guess you could say. Yeah. And so... What what got you to like integrate the the final boss fight? You know, like the clips of her speaking and like what what made you do that decision? Or is that like early on or at the end you decided to do that or what? So I'm I'm a little bit embarrassed to say, but <laughs> Melania was my hardest fight in the game, and it just got that. that's that's agreed upon. Yeah. The yeah, there, there's there's a couple bosses in there that might be harder, but for me, like that was the one I struggled the most with. Yeah. Um, and I just kept hearing over and over, 
I am Melania <laughs> Blade Amicola. And I was just like, oh my god, if I hear this like one more time, I'm just I'm just gonna throw myself out the window. So um yeah, just naturally, I don't know why. I just I thought including the vocal was kind of just like a funny, funny thing for me because it was like, haha, this is the thing I hear before I die. And yeah. you just see the you died, you know, screen. But um yeah, so I, I guess there was like it it I felt like it it almost added to the ambience of the music too, and it kind of makes the listener feel like they're in a boss fight as well. Oh, so yeah. I, I I just wanted to kind of like replicate that feeling I got from playing the game, and then yeah. transitioning it over to like you know the actual song itself. Yeah, Eric and I are. I mean, a lot of times we're making music that sounds like boss fights, whether that's accidental or on purpose. So. I, I, yeah, I loved it. I like, I thought make... the whole thing was intentionally designed to sound like a boss fight from the get-go yeah. just because of how it's structured and how her, like, different clips are, you know, before the different drops. I I think it's it's pretty dope. I have not fought her or beat Elden Ring <laughs> or got close to beating Elden Ring, but I do. Uh, I love the game from what I've played, and, yeah, obviously the artwork is incredible. The music's incredible so super stoked yeah, no, that you uh, uh i, I will say game. that the game the game itself is a lot of fun it can be a little bit annoying to you know die repetitively and i understand that point of of some people's criticisms um but i i think for like the hardcore from soft players or souls born players they're like you know i need to finish this game before i move on to anything else yeah um <laughs> And that boss fight specifically <laughs> was one of those moments for me. And I think the, the cool thing about the song that I wanted to replicate about the game too is like almost the different phases you have. So like, I, I don't know how much you've seen of the boss fight itself, but like the first, I guess, half of the fight, it's like you're kind of just fighting her in like her normal warrior form, I guess you could say. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, cool. I... I beat her, I got her all the way down, like, in terms of her health, and then she's like, just kidding, there's a second phase, and you're like, <laughs> what? what? Why is there a second phase, and why Why is she floating in the air now? Um, yeah. yeah, so, like, I very much wanted the song to kind of uh, have that same image of, like, okay, like, you know, we have the hard uh, dubstep drop first, that's kind of, like, your initial phase one, and then you have this, like, insane melodic drop in the second half of the song with like this insane guitar solo which uh sebastian silva uh is a absolute legend at his craft uh one of the best guitar players i've ever met and um yeah i just i just knew like after talking to him i was like i want to get him involved i think he could i that extra oomph to the yeah. song that i feel yeah, you know to me that's like the highlight it's like the peak yeah. you know peak energy build Phase two, you know, she goes into like her little cocoon or whatever and burst out like in her second form. And then you just get a sweet melodic dubstep drop. But then on top of that, like an uh, insane guitar solo that's happening at the same time. And it doesn't clash and it's like mixed well and like it just makes sense. And it's, uh, I can't say I've really heard anything like that ever. Um, the first couple yeah. drops, I think the second drop. The second drop reminds me of a, uh, what's that Trivecta song? Uh, hmm. Maybe Twilight of the Twilight Gods. Twilight of that's, the Gods. That's, that's what, what I was what it thinking is. too. I was wondering, did you draw any inspiration <laughs> from Twilight of the so, Gods? So, funny enough, Twilight of the Gods was like the reference track for hey. this song. <laughs> that's funny. Um, yeah. So, like, there was definitely some inspiration drawn from there, and um, Trivecta. Although, like, I don't, I don't know him personally. I talked to him a couple times. But yeah, that that song was just like insane to me, and I was like, okay, if I can just take Twilight of the Gods and like you know Elden Ring it, yeah. Um, there was that, and then also uh, in the side trance drop, um, I kind of drew inspiration from Blood uh, by okay. Seven Lines and Kill the Noise because know obviously and I you know have both Bloodborne, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's like, you know, I, I think it's definitely good um, when you're initially building out the song and concept, it's good to have, like, reference tracks for certain sections and then yeah. kind of just build off those ideas, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mostly reference for mixing, um, but if you're not referencing, 
you're losing. You could absolutely. It's, just, it's like the the fastest way to learn. Yeah, production. For I mean, sure. I go through phases as well where, like, sometimes I'll listen to a song a lot, or I'll use like I'll be listening to a song while I'm making a song, so it's like I can use that as inspiration. Yeah. Try to figure out how certain sounds are made and stuff like that. And then I'll, all of a sudden, like, I'll learn some new trick or have some breakthrough. And then I'll, like, for a long time, not listen to anything new. <laughs> and then it gets oh, stale. Absolutely. And I'm like, all right, I got I to gotta start listening to more music again and using references and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, I think something cool for me in the last couple of years has been, like, I've, I've broken out of taking... Um, I'm, I mean, this song's an exception, but I've broken out of taking... Um, reference tracks from EDM and I've kind of pivoted towards like different genres like uh, I mean rock metal um, Brad you've seen some of the stuff I'm working on a lot of that stuff is heavily influenced by those genres and then yeah. also um, there there could be like a couple I guess you could say uh, hip-hop uh, inspired I, I guess like ideas that I'm, I'm messing around with that have reference tracks from like 90s hip hop, which is really weird. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, super, super out there. That, yeah, but that's I think, really out there. Yeah, I, I think it's just cool to take inspiration from things that aren't really there in your space, you know? Yeah. Um, because, like, you know, at, at this point, let's be real, you know, anyone can make melodic bass music or future bass music, whatever you want to call it. But I think taking things that have inspired you throughout the years and kind of taking that style of melodic bass or um, future bass, whatever you want to call it, and molding it to like your catered style, I think that's where you can make something truly unique. Yeah, I think everyone doing that right now is really shining because of it. And I mean, you know, everyone watching this has probably heard Cross to Bear and it's like, you know, that's... Clearly, you know, Eric and I have been listening to a lot of metal, <laughs> and yeah. I've been listening, honestly, to nothing nothing but metal in movie scores for the last, like, 18 months. <laughs> like, I don't really ever listen to electronic stuff just at this point. I don't know why. I just kind of lost interest, but... Yeah. That... I know that's I think, I think that's you can fair. hear that clearly in Cross the Bears. Like, it's a movie score, very heavy metal influences... And then there's these cool EDM drops. Um, I think, and that's that's kind of like what's needed to do something fresh, you know, where things are at in the bass scene. Because, you know, every everything, every good song's already been written, you know, in the classic melodic dubstep style of future bass. Like, people have done everything. If you go and yeah, make... it's really hard to make it interesting without yeah. meshing many genres yeah. together at this if point if you're just like making you a, to... even if it's a really damn good melodic bass tune with a good vocalist that's just not not enough with people's attention spans and i'm not saying you should do it yeah. just to grab people's attention um well no like it's should, also way cooler yeah it's you just should cooler. just create yeah. what you Absolutely. want and merge merge the different things that you like because you get such a more unique output mm -hmm. it's and more fulfilling for you like the listener enjoys it more. It's just it's a like yeah. telling a whole story too. It's not just like, not just this one simple emotion. Yeah, you yeah. have like, what? De it depends on what the song is, of course. But you can have like sadness and then hardship and then overcoming all in one song. Yeah, and I think that is very powerful to like lead people into those emotions. It's like it's actually like taking them through a healing journey. Yeah. 100%. Definitely, and I, I, I do want to say, like, you know, not to fangirl or anything, but Cross to Bear absolutely did that <laughs> for me, personally. Uh, I, I have a small, funny story for you guys. Um, so I, I was playing a show out in Austin, and I, like, I just love Cross to Bear so much that I was just like, I'm just going to throw my set, you know? Like, whatever. I'm going to throw that and Starshot in. Hey. And Cross to Bear, I remember specifically, like, thinking in my head like before i played it i was like oh my god i don't know if this crowd is gonna like metal stuff <laughs> i'm like i know it's like kind of a niche thing uh for some people and they're like i don't like the screams dude i i just kept my head down like for that first drop and then i like 
halfway through lifted my head up and everybody was just going insane to it and i was like oh my god these people like metal okay there's something <laughs> here yeah so who, I, who the, I i'm curious who the like headliner was for the show yeah the the headliner was uh kaivon K- Kayvon, oh, yeah. I could be saying okay. that wrong. I, I would also be very scared to play a metal song yeah, before Kayvon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If, if yeah. it were like Seven Lions, you know you know that he's got the metal roots and like people probably are interested in that since it's apparent in a lot of his writing. You know, you could see the crossover, but like Kayvon's like, oh God, I really hope this yeah. lands. <laughs> yeah. Dude, and, and he was such a nice guy, like, because uh, I think you could kind of tell I was a little bit nervous. So he walked up to me before the show because I have my guitar on the side and I, I have this like little, uh, it's called like an Asus ROG Ally. Yeah. It's like basically like a Game Boy, but I was using that as my guitar amp. Uh, but anyway, he wa- walks up to me and he's like, hey, dude, like, I see you look a little nervous. Uh, don't think about it. Just have a good time. And I was like, you're, you're cool if I, if I play like anything, right? And he's like, dude, literally play whatever. I don't care. He's like, just, just do you put on your best show. Well, and that's um, screaming yeah. metal music. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's exactly. Dope, though, that he like <coughs> approached you because he saw that yeah. and wanted to, you yeah, know, that is hype nice. you up a little, tell you to do whatever, you know, because everyone's scared to step on toes with, you know, the headliner and try mm-hmm. not to have more energy or, you know, whatever. Yeah, so, sounds like he's super chill, cool guy. Yeah, and I, I have a huge respect for or headlining acts that are like that, that are not like, hey, I don't want you to do this thing uh, because, um, like, I feel like it will take some light away from me or something. Yeah. And he absolutely didn't give me that. Um, I mean, you you guys know the Last Heroes guys. They were the exact same way for me when I also opened up for them. They're like, dude, you want to bring your guitar out? Go for it, you know? So that, yeah. that to me, like, guys like that, I, I just have so much respect for them, and it means yeah. the world... As someone that's like kind of trying to get, like, you know, out there more and get seen, um, yeah, it's it's just nice to kind of not not be cut like that. I yeah, guess, and I mean, if that makes sense. Like, if you're you know really making music and like trying to put on the show, the best show that you can do, and like you're doing it for the right reasons, and you want people to have the best night, like you want everyone to do their best performance. And, like, whether their music is, you know, quote, higher energy or lower energy or whatever, it's just, like, none of that, whatever serves the crowd who paid money to be there, you know, whatever's going to be the best experience, like, that means everyone put on your best show. Obviously, it's, it's pretty annoying when people just, like, play, just rhythm the entire time. No, of course. And then they aren't, (laughs) unless it's their music. Like, if it's your music, go for it. Like, you should always be true to your artist self as much as you can but uh yeah just there's always some like just djs you know that are just throwing they're like throwing down vastive on the opening set and it's like okay (laughs) yeah don't don't play (coughs) two subtronics drops at the same time got it okay (laughs) i'm gonna turn this light on uh how many how many shows have you played oh man um as Jaden Carr, just three or four now. Um, I did used to go by another alias, with Euphoria, and then before that, I did uh, Astronaut. Don't ever look up that music. Astronaut. That is atrocious. I don't don't be... ask. Don't should ask. We, don't look it up, it please. Uh, let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what happened? <laughs> he was talking about yeah. his own alias. It was called oh, Astronaut yeah. or something. Yeah, so I had an alias back in 2017 named uh, Astronaut, like A S T R O N O T. A S S. Trust her not. Yeah. <laughs> Astro yeah, never um, again. <laughs> dude, and I'll, like, I kind of cringe at it now because, like, I, I wore, like, essentially an astronaut helmet with, like, yes. LEDs on it. Don't ask, man. I I just thought it was That's like a cool really thing at a time. I, I know, I know. I I look back on it and I'm just like, that was a stepping stone for what you actually want to do, okay, bud? Yeah, hey, it is. But, um, it really is, though. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I I don't always think like you know the first project that you land on may be your last. Like I think you may have a couple things, whether it be like you know, um, I I don't know one one 
artist alias that's doing rock or another one that's doing like strictly EDM, dubstep rhythm, or, you know, even joining a band and yeah. things like that. So like, I think it's good to kind of like have your hand out there and try different things before oh, you just yeah, say course, like, yeah. oh, you I know, I agree, my friend. Yeah. I've had many and, too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Eric and I both made a bunch of different genres, but like yeah. in the last year I got into metal and like, I've been doing an entire metal project that yeah. will remain unnamed and unknown <laughs> but like just spending all that time producing another genre that i love that i never tried my hand at like that allowed me to bring so many things back to electronic music and yeah. like merge into and like you're gonna do a better job if you go head on into that genre and like ex you know experiment and that stuff and then bring back what you've learned it's just like a it's a super it's just a hack really it's like produce as many genres as you can yeah yeah absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's similar it's like adjacent to what we were saying earlier about trying to mix things together and yeah listen to different kinds of music yeah listen to everything try to make stuff that you like doesn't matter what genre yeah. it is and like when you get that diverse input you get a diverse output through your music it might be electronic but it could have all these different flavors that no one else is is doing and and then it just it really starts to sound like you and i think that's what people like swarm have done super well is that it's so Absolutely. clear all the things that he loves and they are mm -hmm. all apparent in every song that he puts out and it might be super niche and you know maybe a lot of people don't like it but that's it's not what it's about it's like make make the thing that's the closest to your soul I've been reading this book lately. Uh, I don't know where it is. It's it's this Rick Rubin. Rick, sorry, I can't speak. Rick Rubin book. Brad, you know about it because I think you told me about it. It's the creative act of of thinking. Yeah. Um, and just just Rick Rubin dives into a lot of like making things that you want to make. You know, like you shouldn't. I I'm not saying you shouldn't go for this, but my goal at the end of the day is to kind of make the music I want to hear. You know, and I feel like you guys definitely are probably on that same boat, you know, oh, yeah. like I, I don't really care too much about the numbers or, you know, playing a big festival or any of that stuff, because like at the end of the day, like I know my time on this earth is limited and I want to leave behind something I think was groundbreaking, even if only like a hundred people heard it or something. Yeah. You know, I'm right there with you. And I, I think Eric and I would a hundred percent agree with you on that. And that's like my favorite thing that Rick Rubin has ever said. Uh, yeah. Is, is that, you know, it's not a direct quote, but he basically said that you make music for you and no one else. The fan does not come first. The artist comes yeah. first. If the artist Absolutely. makes exactly what the artist wants to make, the fans will come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's as simple as and that. If the artist makes exactly what the fans want, they're not an artist. True. It just defeats the whole purpose. Yeah. yeah, you're 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 kind of just like a business mm -hmm. making some product that you hope people will, will purchase. Yeah, and you know sometimes it can be like high risk and high reward. Like for me, playing cross the bear in front of like a Kaifon crowd, that was like <laughs> big risk. But I'm sure I nah, introduced I people to something new that they didn't even know that they liked. You know? Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that's that's too, just the like, coolest thing. How much. You know, people are there for a dubstep show or future bass show, but like you'd be surprised how many people love all different genres. Like we get so narrow minded yeah. about it. But I remember my first EDM show of all time, it was Adventure Club, House of Blues Orlando. It was like 2017, 2016. Shoot. Yeah. Let's say probably 2016. Um Yeah. And they, you know, they played all their all their hits, you know, all the big dubstep tunes of that time, um, of most of which they were producing because they were insane. And uh, the end of the night, their like encore song was this straight up screamo metal like infused thing, and they just like straight up played out this this metal banger at the end of their show. Hell yeah! And you're that like was, that's everyone, so everyone, <laughs> everyone lost their minds like. 
it's a bunch of you know teenagers and like college age kids <laughs> just like at this dubstep show and then they just play out this this metal tune at the end and everyone is just like losing their shit completely it's like is that the target audience yeah. <laughs> probably not but like it it translated yeah. really well because well, they were just having fun i think yeah it says something cool about the bass music scene i think like people who listen to bass music are very receptive to other yeah. things being infused into True. it absolutely um, that's something very cool about just edm in general is like people expect you to infuse other stuff because it's always been it's been a genre made of you know remixes since yeah. since yeah. it started, yeah, you know that's actually a good point. That's true. It's like yeah, like what what was what got people into EDM most of the time was like yeah, I heard some cool remix of like a Coldplay song or something, and they're like, oh, that was sick. And then oh, yeah, yeah, it's just it's the gateway. Um, and I love to see that remixes are still such a integral part of EDM. I think that's important. Yeah, I I always think of like using other genres, like the the song itself like the edm parts of the song are kind of like the the sketch of whatever picture you're trying to paint and then the other genres mixed in are like the colors and you're like yeah. painting this scene so it has like all these flavors and and whatnot from whatever genres you want to mix in yeah speaking of genres that you want to mix in Jaden. yeah you alluded to it what what do you work <coughs> so I'm not going to get too into the weeds right now, but I am working on an EP for you guys at Exuvium. Uh, it takes a Dude, lot of inspiration. What? What? He's I'm sorry? working on an EP for us? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Surprise. Um, no, but um, yeah, it takes a lot of inspiration from, from bands like Metallica, Rage Against the Machine, Ghost, Beer Box, Sleep Token. Just all these like kind of bands for, for their day were kind of like when they started out, they were kind of weird, I guess, if that if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But man, just like some of the guitar work I, I listen to, like whether it's like uh, one by Metallica or um, I don't know, uh, a Cerise by, by Ghost, it's just like the guitar work in it to me is so cool. And um, for those of you that don't know, I got into playing guitar around the pandemic time because uh, Funny enough, taking inspiration from another game, uh, Cyberpunk, uh, there's a band in there from one of the main characters. His name is Johnny Silverhand, and the band's name is Samurai. And there's a mission in there specifically where you're like, okay, I want to relive the good old days of the Samurai band. So you go on stage and you get this like first person view of playing guitar. And like, I'll never forget, like, that was what sparked in me of like, I want to play guitar because <laughs> yeah. this is just insane. Like yeah. just looking at how how much fun it looked and like how having that connection with like other band members was like it, it was just the coolest thing to me. So then the next week I picked up my Fender Stratocaster and I absolutely sucked ass. And it yeah. sucks. And you know, like guitar is one of those things where it takes years and you know, like even then you still may not be the best. I am not the best. So I'm definitely your uh, power chord dandy. Uh, so I'm just sitting there playing power chords. You want a guitar solo? Too bad, bud. It's going to be the slowest thing imaginable. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so um, yeah, this this EP definitely focuses a lot on on where that inspiration for me came from to to play guitar and those bands that have influenced me a lot growing up. Yeah, and it. it's it's definitely going to tackle some some uh, not not great subjects um politics war economies things like that um well, things that's what that a lot of those kind of bands were world. were thinking about and writing about absolutely so um i mean really it's 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 not it's not a new a new thing to to be writing about the state yeah. of the world and the negative aspects of that but what i think is really cool and a cool opportunity is that that's never something that's done in electronic music. Electronic Absolutely. music is always, you know, it's it's feel good stuff, you know, or a breakup song, or or love yeah. song, <laughs> or breakup song, or just like <coughs> how beautiful everything is. And I I love that. I really do. And yeah, it it's super positive and like inspiring. Just feel good, you know. Feel it's good, good escape music from. It's an amazing things. escape. Yeah, and that's kind of kind of what it was built on is like being this grand escape, but. 
you know, we've had that for many years, and that's dope. And yeah, we, you know, what's wrong with maybe writing on some, some less pretty and fun topics, and go into something a, a little more. I only make pretty music. <laughs> yeah. Eric makes never makes heavy dubstep. That's no, angry. I've never Eric, I've never heard a, a heavy song from you, bud. I know. <laughs> Just I've, I've been thinking about dabbling in it. <laughs> yeah, you should try. You should try to make some tear out. Yeah, yeah but um, I. I, I really think just going back to to what you're saying, a lot of EDM acts haven't do that. And, you know, no shade to the people that want to write feel-good music. Hey, yeah, or, there's yeah, nothing wrong with that. There's a time and a uh, place. Yeah, you know, and, I mean, hey, I'll, I'll, I'm the first to say, like, I am definitely a Lenium fanboy, but, like, yeah. what, what if we took that energy and applied it to something that's, like, a, almost a sensitive topic, but something that should be talked about you know like yeah. uh last year metallica came out with this album it was kind of like you know received mixed kind of i i really liked it but one of the songs on there was called screaming suicide which obviously suicides uh yeah. a super touchy subject you know and i'm i'm here to say you know if you do need help definitely seek it out um go look for those resources if you can but the thing that james hetfield of metallica mentioned was like I wrote this song basically because, you know, I know it's a sensitive subject, but we should talk about it and we should talk about how we feel during those moments, but how we can also overcome them. And I kind of want to take the same approach to this EP. Mm -hmm. I want to basically say, you know, hey, like we are the younger generation. We are Gen Z. We are younger millennials, whatever you want to be called, Gen Alpha. But we want to make our voices heard because, and I'm sure you guys can attest to this. Like, I feel like our generation's kind of being screwed over a lot of things. And I mean, we're going to get touch political here, but like Nikki Haley saying, um, the retirement age should be, you know, increased. Dude, I was just That's talking hilarious. about this I man just... said that like 15 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. so I was like, that you is know? so insane. Yeah. It should reflect <laughs> life expectancy. Yeah, and she You're she was claiming that that. <laughs> that life expectancy has increased, which it, right. it hasn't. There was there's no study that has claimed that life expectancy has increased. But you know, I I have talked to like the older generation, like my grandparents, my my parents, and they're like, you know, by the time you get to our age and you're gonna need social security, more than likely it's not there. Yeah, and I kind of mm -hmm. want this EP to be the groundwork of talking about those conversations talking about like hey we are here we are alive and we want change not just for us but the people after us you know yeah because like dude look 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 at i mean i'm sure you you guys may not be looking into a house and i'm not looking into buying a house but i mean when when we want to the... do that yeah, yeah when we when we want to do that <laughs> 10 years from now it's kind of like well you know we're paying four grand or three grand Dude, a I'm, month for a I'm, house that's I'm crazy thinking about it right now and this is hilarious of like i'm, gonna live in a I'm determining the next state that i'm gonna live in based on if i can afford a house there yeah because like i make a good income at my nine to five job and like i am in no position whatsoever to even think about buying a house like in colorado like it's just not gonna happen and I'm going to have to have my income doubled before I can, like, yeah. put a down payment on a house. Yeah. And, yeah, that's just one example of, like, yeah, our generation's in a very difficult spot with a lot of different things. And, you know, inflation's through the roof and this and that. And it's just, yeah. like, really feels like a shit show around us. So I think you <laughs> wanting to voice your opinion on that is awesome. And, like, yeah. you know, the the internet can be this, like, sea of opinions that are just this horrible, horrible place but when people do it in music i think it translates really beautifully and yeah the intention i don't know one of my favorite bands is is rise against and yeah that's their Dude, whole great thing band. it's just all yeah. they write about is like what they want changed in the world and that's awesome it's like even if i don't necessarily agree with every opinion that they have on things it's like at least they're going out and like trying to do something about it and trying to make a change and like fight for what they think is right and that's awesome. So anyone trying to do that through music, like hats off to them. 
So I'm really yeah. excited to see like where you go, especially lyrically, because I know kind of what you're doing musically, but I'm yeah. I'm uh, excited to see what form that takes with vocals and lyrics, because uh, that's kind of the core of, of the message, right? Is the lyrics. Yeah, and I, I definitely want to take like the Zach De La Rocha of Rage Against the Machine approach of like maybe not having a lot of vocals, but more so um, when I do say something, it's like in the tonality of it that matters. Mm -hmm. So like killing in the name of, you know, like it just has this attitude to yeah. it. Like he repeats over and over again, some of those that burn, uh, that want forces burn crosses, you know? He says that over and over again, but the thing that changes is his tone and his energy with it. And yeah. that's like, that's why like, it never fails. Like I'll always play like a killing in the name uh, edit at my shows and people just resonate with it because yeah. they, they just have this built up frustration <laughs> and I see it in them. And for them to just like go crazy with it, I'm like, okay, that, but like, let's, let's put it into like the EDM space, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, that's, it's more, it's more about, you know, is the message delivered? It doesn't matter how many words it takes you to say that. You don't have to be necessarily super poetic or intricate. Yeah. You know, like the, the bridge, if you want to call it a bridge, cross the bear. It's just like, mm -hmm. you will not cripple me. You will not cripple me. And it just like gets more and more aggressive. And then you have this hate step drop by Eric <laughs> where it's just, you know, it's like Me? all of this tension's building the whole song. And then all you need is just, you know, one sentence to yeah. like nail the point and you yeah. just keep repeating it. And then the message is very Absolutely. clear and it sounds like the same thing with your example. It's like, you know, it's more about the quality than the quantity. It's more about how the message is being delivered. It doesn't have to be fancy, you know? Yeah, and, you know, like, I, I, I'll be the first to admit, like, maybe not everyone might be a fan of my political stance on things. And that's totally fine if you're not. Um, the point I want to get across is, you know, like, hey, if we don't agree with each other, let's talk about it. Let's talk why. Yeah. You know, it shouldn't be, like, left versus right. Like, I mean, again, we see this with the older generation of, like, no, they're wrong. Biden's wrong. Trump's wrong. Yeah. You, you guys are crazy. And it's like, <laughs> it's like these these vocal minorities that are both extremes on both sides are just going at each other's necks. And then it's like us people in the middle that do want resolution or do want to talk about it. We're kind of just being drowned out by yeah. these insane people. <laughs> and it's like, at, at some point, it's like, okay, that's fine that we don't agree with each other, but, like, let's try to come up with a solution. Because yeah. I, I feel like in modern politics, a lot of the time, it, it's just become, like, we we don't want to go for your bill because we don't like the team that you play for, essentially. Yeah, you know, well, that's, and that's like, 100% what it is for, like, 80% of the population, probably more. It's just... I see this color, I vote this way, anything else that yep. the other side says, I ignore. And that's just like ignorance at its finest. Mm -hmm. And anyone not willing to just speak to someone who has a different opinion, like I don't think you should be able to vote. <laughs> if, if you can't have a civil conversation with someone who disagrees with you, I don't think you should get to vote because you're, you're showing no – nothing, like no intelligence, emotional – empathy like Brad's an authoritarian yes <laughs> king, it's king for a reason king of yeah. God. it's not democracy <laughs> yeah right <laughs> jokes I, of course i'm the monarch no but yeah like I, I people say, can't um, have conversations it's insane yeah, yeah that's crazy and i i saw this hbo documentary uh by i don't know if you guys know who andrew callahan is um he has no this yeah right <laughs> he has this youtube channel called channel five uh he used to work for this company called all gas no breaks basically what he does is like he goes to a, a political hotspot of like going to the border going to like the january 6 movement and like speaking to the people and letting them speak their minds and why they're frustrated but the thing that he noted in his documentary which i thought was so insightful is a lot of these people are looking to tr channel that energy somewhere and I, I don't blame them but we have to look at why they're getting upset you know and i i 
personally think it's coming from places like CNN or Fox News where they're like just eco chambers of bad news constantly yeah. where they just keep repeating each other and just keep saying, what's Trump doing now? What's Biden doing now? Um, and yeah. it, it just it just gets people that watch that so amped up. And the whole reason why they do that <laughs> is so that way they can sell their vitamins on well, the commercial yeah, that yeah. comes five minutes after, you know? It's like, you or know, I'm going to go down to the White House with my vitamins or whatever. You know? Even to be more conspiracy theorist about it, it's to keep the politicians in power that are in power. Because you have this, like, false illusion of choice. And it's just, like, constantly choosing between these two options when there's more options. But they're just drowned out. Because all they're doing is talking about these other, these two people that no one likes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I also think that it's totally a power move to divide and conquer right yeah. it's like in exactly. every every you know book on war and tactics you know an easy way to conquer your enemy is to divide them so and so if you have a two a solo while a you're yes. yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> you have no, a two-party uh, system going. and you have everyone hating each other split down the middle hating each other not listening you can control that population yeah. a lot easier than reasonable yeah. people having conversations Absolutely, and that's that's why like this this guitar means a lot to me. It was um, it was given to to me by a close family friend before he passed away. Um, but on the guitar, I wrote, you know, divide divide the people, control the masses, you know, because like I do very much feel that message of like, you know, we I I mean I'm not gonna say we've America as a whole like we're the most divided we've ever been, but it seems like it's been a growing trend in the last. 15 years for sure yeah um and i mean whenever whenever fans or or anyone sees me play guitar on stage i want them to know like hey it's okay this is like a safe space for us where we can talk about these issues you don't have to feel like you're on one side or the other like because at the end of the day it should be us versus the problem not yeah, us versus exactly, each other yeah you yeah. know while the problem lingers yeah so. but the yeah the powers that be try to convince you that your brother is the problem. And in reality, yeah. we all need to be just listening to each other and having open conversations and be willing to hear the other side and give the other person the benefit of the doubt that they're not someone who's just like evil and trying to do bad things. And instead, maybe they could be mistaken. Maybe you could be mistaken. Yeah. And that's it. But we yeah. we can all agree that we want to work towards a better world. If we can like accept all those things, then that's yeah. like the basis of building a society that's healthier. This is exactly yeah. the type of thing that we like to talk about on the podcast. Politics, <laughs> baby. <laughs> no, but but what right. we like to talk about is the message of the musician. Mm -hmm. And this is why this is why we're stoked to have you on Exuvium because yeah. You know, yeah, you're talking about politics. You're not scared to. That's cool. And, you know, it's it's about a message of, like, peace, ultimately. It's like you mm, want yeah. the world to be better. You want people to to love each other and, and be at peace and not argue while we keep suffering, you know? It's like the, the yeah. message is something that everyone can agree on because the world would be better if it were that way, right? And so... Yeah, we we applaud you that you're writing music about that stuff, and you know Eric and my message, our our separate messages, take yeah. on a totally different form of like more like looking at the individual and and what, how, what the individual needs to do to grow mm -hmm. and then bring that better person into the society into the world. And if we all do that, then we can build a better world. That's an awesome thing too. It's like mm -hmm. it's cool to have these two like you have the macro view. Of like, man, we no. need to communicate and have empathy. And ours is like the micro, like individual level of like, you don't have to live in these negative cycles that you're living in. Like you can, you can be the better version of yourself that you want to be. You can conquer your demons or integrate your demons. And I just love that we're all, we're all preaching just the change we want to see in the world, really. Too. They're all related. 
Yeah, I mean, they're all, they're necessary. Both are necessary, that you know? Yeah. And also, like, on a macro level, with the stories we've written and stuff, like, it, it tackles some True. of those issues, like, uh, yeah. about defying authority. Yeah, all and... of our stories have this oppressive authority that is is forcing people to do, really, just to, to not live lives in which they have freedom and choices you know it's, it's mm -hmm. these oppressive forces you know your story has that in kind of like a sci-fi flavor Jaden and Eric's in mind in like a fantasy um maybe a little sprinkle of sci-fi in there uh kind of world but mm -hmm. I think that's why that's why we just instantly you know kind of connected and and we're like yeah let's let's all make music and put it out on Exuvium and that's what Exuvium is yeah. about it's about you know mm -hmm. putting out that that message into the world. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I do like to see the different worlds that we have because how I currently see our record label is kind of like, uh, you know, the publisher CD Projekt Red. I feel like you guys are kind of like making the Witcher games and then I'm kind of focusing on the cyberpunk stuff, if you will. Yeah. Um, so I, <laughs> I think it's kind of cool to have two different worlds and then definitely at some point have those worlds kind of cross over from time to time or have references to each other, you know? Yeah, that's dope. I would love to do that. Have like have like a little Easter egg somewhere in my story that references like a company in your story or something cool. I don't know. There's lots yeah, of cool crossovers. Same. But by the way, Witcher, uh, at least I can speak, Witcher 3 is an incredible game. Absolutely. And I'm sure the, <laughs> the other Witcher games are great too. But I, I'm guessing you played Witcher 3? Yeah, I, I played Witcher 3. And... Uh, yeah, the, the combat in it for me feels really good. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's it. They really nailed the like magic and melee. Just like, oh, it's beautiful. And and I mean, the game is visually awesome. Storytelling oh, yeah. awesome. Just ticks all the boxes for me. Uh, I, that kind of makes me think of a question I had earlier, but I refrained from asking, which is sure. Have you played all the Dark Souls games? Oh man. Um... So, spoiler alert, no. Um, hey, look, I, I haven't played any of dude, them, so I, I am not one to judge. Yeah, that means nothing yeah, to me. Dude, I played, I think I was in college and I played Dark Souls 3. And I was just getting absolutely dumpstered by everything. And, like, I was kind of new to the Souls-born right. universe. It's a different type of combat than anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's cool, I died. Like, I'm just going to respawn back. Uh, to where I just was. Oh, no, I'm at the beginning of the game. Okay, that's probably what those bonfire things are for, huh? Okay, <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> at least I knew that one going into the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, but what what I liked was uh, about Elden Ring specifically, and it's like the first, uh, uh, it's the first Souls-born game, whatever you want to call, uh, that I actually finished and played through. And I was just like, oh my gosh, maybe like I should go back and play the Souls game. Uh, as much as difficult as it might be at some point, um, but I just think the world in in that in the Elden Ring universe or the the uh, Bloodborne universe or the the Dark Souls universe, that lore is just so rich and so beautiful. But what makes it even cooler is like it's not most of the time it's not right in front of your face. It's like uh -huh. you kind of have to either look at your surroundings or like any other mmo you gotta like read um read like lore tabs to yeah. kind of understand what's going on in the world and even then it's like you're 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 understanding it from your perspective yeah. so what's cool is like you know i i may say hey uh millennia and radon from from elden ring are really bad guys but you might just think like oh they're just a byproduct of where they were in their hierarchy of, of family or whatever you know yeah, like that. Well, there's so, something really cool just to be said about storytelling, and there's like, in world building, you know, there's like, Tolkien's an example of uh, of really, what's the word? I guess hard world building versus soft world bu world building, and I think the Souls franchise does this kind of soft world building where you they give you pieces uh, yeah. that you can like look at and maybe read, you know, this transcript or this book on a shelf and you get these little pieces but the the whole thing is never told to you and explained to you and that's kind of how like a lot of studio ghibli films play out too is like you're getting this you it's just 
you're in this world and you're finding out things by seeing and seeing the story unfold. Tolkien's like, okay, I wrote an entire language. This is the exact history of everything in this book, The Silmarillion. <laughs> so it's there's just so many different ways you can do it. And I think I personally, most of the time, I think Lord of the Rings is the greatest trilogy of all time. <laughs> But yeah. most of the time, I prefer soft world building where you get little pieces <coughs> and, and you almost have to kind of imagine and fill in the blanks in a sense. What would you say your musical story, uh, you think that's more of a, a soft world that you're building or more like defined, rigid things that you've thought deeply about, like complex uh, intricacies and stuff? What do you think? Yeah, like I, I would personally probably say i'm going for more of a, a soft world building i mean on on y'all's website we kind of have a have like a little bit of a background story of what what's going on in my world uh and it kind of gives you like a brief introduction of what's going on and uh i mean i i won't i guess i don't want to do too much spoiling but the 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 crimson movement is kind of kind of like this real world's bands like the the Rage Against the Machines, the Metallicas, the the uh, Sleep Tokens, or whatever. They're the people that want to speak out against the oppressors, and how you view them is kind of like your opinion on the world, you know. So mm -hmm. it, it's like I'm just kind of putting talk like um, I guess their actions out there, like whether you think it be ethical or non-ethical or moral or not, you know, like. So it, it kind of does tie back into like soft soft launching the story and kind of putting it in front of the reader because yeah. uh, you know guys like you, uh, uh, Brad, King of None, or Celestial Void, Mox Jade, uh, even Seven Lions. Like I think what you guys do with your visuals is just the coolest thing because it's not again it's not telling the viewer what's happening. It's just letting them perceive like understand it from their viewpoint. So yeah. that's that's definitely something I want to follow. Yeah, yeah, I think I think the visuals are a great way to to do some soft world building because yeah, you're not you're not explaining everything. You're not necessarily explicitly showing something that's happening from start to finish, but you're kind of getting these glimpses of it's more of like a mood that you're experiencing and you see what the world looks like and it's like the tone is there, the feeling tone, but you know, it might be a glimpse of a story, but you're you're trying to piece together the whole thing. And I like to drop little snippets, and Eric does too, on social media, mm -hmm. you know, to, like, our, you know, super tight fan base. Our... Check out the Mage Fest visuals, if you haven't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Eric Great stuff, some, by the way. Some Thanks. banger visuals that, uh, that he himself made that are very telling of parts of his story. But yeah, I think that's part of the fun, is, like, the people that want to really dive in and, like, figure stuff out, the resources are there to do that and yeah. you know that paragraph of lore that i wrote on that post three months ago is there if someone really wants to go find out same with eric mm -hmm. um yeah. i just think that's so cool that like people can kind of get what they want and the super diehards can go kind of figure out the story like the stuff is there just like in you know um the dark souls games it's like the people that really want to figure stuff out can go read every single book in the game uh -huh. and have a better idea than most <laughs> people, right? Yeah, and it's like how however immersed that you want to be in that world, that yeah. that choice is up to you. You know, I I think you can only spoon feed someone so much story before they're like, all right, this is boring. You yeah. know, it's kind of like you have to you have to put it like in front of them, but not give it directly yeah. to them. You got to make them work for it a little. Bit. Especially so that like, way, they're like, oh wow, I found this. You know. Yeah, it feels good to like. Oh, I found I know something that other people don't know. Like that's a good, mm -hmm. a good feeling, and yeah, all, you know at the end or of the day, it's like theorizing and like yeah, there's fun to yeah, like theory craft what's happening. Like I saw like, a <coughs> thirty minute lore video on um, like symbolism in the Dark Souls games, and I watched it because it was sick. And like I haven't even played the Dark Souls games, but yeah. like you know what they're yeah. using for symbols and stuff, and like how it relates to alchemy and like. Um, the Philosopher's Stone, like, it was all this cool, this cool stuff that I geek out about, but yeah. just the fact that, like, it's there and people can theorycraft about it, that's so cool. But at the end of the day, like, we're all 
primarily musicians. So yeah. sometimes it's difficult to, as much as I like, honestly, just love storytelling and world building. It's like at the end of the day, you know, the music's the first thing. And then yep. if I can tell the story through the music, that's awesome. But the music comes first. And then, you know, I don't want to spend all of my free time, you know, writing out a story. I want to, yeah. you know, write music and then yeah. integrate the story into that and kind of piece it all together. Yeah, absolutely. And I couldn't agree more. Um, and like one example I think of, which is really weird because, you know, we're, we're all, all three of us are obviously playing Baldur's Gate together. The soundtrack in that game is just oh. so good. Oh. And it just... <laughs> Dude, yeah, like the, when you start Baldur's Gate, that choir yeah. is just, I get, I get so excited when I hear that. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like, oh, something's happening. It's you ominous. Know? <laughs> it's like the Halo 3 start menu, but super dark. Yeah. yeah, and you know, like, a lot of the time, music is, like, people's first introduction to a story that's yeah. happening. So, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, with Baldur's Gate, they have that attention grabber with uh, with the choir. And, you know, that's something that's something I also wanted to do with Scarlet Rot was, like, okay, I wanted to, like, grab people's attention, like, from the get-go. You know, they're like, oh, what's going yeah. on? That's kind of mystical. And that's just, like, drop, and then big choir, you know? Because yeah. it's like, oh, something is happening. And that's that's just really cool to me. Um, yeah, yeah, when we're able and, and, to do that. And something that you know, video games and and movies do really well is they'll have themes for specific, um, yes. like characters this or is what I love. bits of the story, yeah. like a recurring theme. So they'll have these musical motifs that repeat themselves throughout the story to remind you of like, oh, this character grew up in this town, and like now I remember that yeah. because two hours into the movie. I'm like hearing this theme again and it's like in this super important part and it just all pieces together. Um, all your yeah. favorite composers do it. And that's something it that, like subtly yeah. foreshadows and, and explains the backstory mm -hmm. to you without ever saying yeah. it, word, it connects very cool. so much yeah, in key your mind. moments together. Like, yeah, without saying a word, that's a beautiful thing. And I think it's something that Hans Zimmer has done extraordinarily well yeah. in Dune specifically. Cause a lot of people talk about, Dune doesn't have a lot of dialogue. It's just like all this music and very sparse dialogue. But because of Hans Zimmer's score, it's like you don't even yep. need the dialogue because the story visually and musically yeah. is already being told to you. Absolutely. And these themes that he you know, plays throughout. And Eric has gotten me onto that train now with the electronic <laughs> music and, yeah. and the, the metal stuff I'm making. I have these recurring <laughs> motifs throughout... Well, yeah. different songs and they're in different keys maybe or slowed or, or sped up but that's something that eric does really well well i think i i was influenced by when i was younger i loved spider-man like every little boy does. okay yeah <laughs> of course I hell yeah spider -Man. yeah that, he was never what I hate, dude i hate superheroes i'm gonna be honest well i wasn't like I'll, i wasn't like you can't hate toby mcguire yeah there's it just was no way you actually can that toby specifically that movie the yeah. score in that movie <laughs> has yeah. motifs and like it it tells the story through the music and even as like a child unconsciously maybe but i could pick up on that and as i got older like i i obviously listened to it more and i noticed it more and i think that was like the first thing that i can remember that really struck me in that way where i was like okay I, I'm going to do this in my music. Yeah. Like when I'm writing these like score pieces. Yeah. When, when you start to view music as like a story, that's when it really connected in my mind of yeah. like, well, stories have, you know, these pillars, these themes that are revisited throughout the story and they evolve and you see how a person or a group of people mm -hmm. or a civilization like oh. changes. Um, yeah. Just with a simple no. melody. Yeah, that's what's cool. Is like, you take that same melody and you put it over a chord change. Yep. And it is yep. a completely different part in this journey. Yep. Where... Eric's been blowing my mind with this stuff. <laughs> and like, I'm we'll like just, just learning it all for the and first like time. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, I can take this melody I wrote for like the main character, like his theme, and I can put it over this different chord progression in a different key and it is like suddenly this heroic moment instead of oh. this like sorrowful introspective moment 
but you're still understanding that this is this is just the complexity of that that person it's the same person yeah. just and and it just it's a beautiful way to show the complexity of us all as human beings uh, oh and, yeah and, and i to, oh sorry you go ahead oh no I, I was just gonna say like you know we obviously play halo together i don't know if you guys have played halo reach Yes, um, I've played. Oh, yeah. I've played. I actually played game. it for the first time this year. What? Really? What? Yeah. yeah. Oh I, my gosh! I, after Halo really? Three, I'm like, I ain't doing nothing unless it's Bungie. <laughs> and then, well, Halo I Reach. guess Reach was the last Bungie one. Yeah. But I yeah. just like, I don't know. Like, I was in World of Warcraft, and I just, I was off. And Reach is good. That was my first yeah. like Halo game I dove into, because I was like around the time I got into it. Yeah, Reach was a good one. Yeah, the the Halo that franchise has too. yeah, yeah it has like a very special place in my heart because it was like yeah. one of the uh, first campaign games I played with my grandpa. Like we played Halo One together, Halo Two together, uh, Halo Three, all the Halos pretty much up until Reach. That's awesome. uh, kind of like you, Brad. And yeah, it was it was very cool to hear uh, Martin O'Donnell's the composer of those of those games, and it's very cool to like. Especially in Reach, I think he uses like the the Phrygian dominant scale, but he calls back to like the original Halo theme from Halo One, or even like yeah. the the guitar like shredding Halo stuff, stuff from Halo Two. Oh, yeah. yeah, and that's just like the coolest thing to me. Even like uh, John Williams of like who did Star Wars. Yeah, like when you listen to the that's new era Star Wars stuff. Of what we're talking about too. Yeah. Like, they, they call back to, like, the original trilogy soundtrack. Like, I don't know, Darth yeah. Vader walking yeah. in. Like, Very dawn, strong. Dawn, yeah, no, dawn. Star Wars is you know? a great example. It's probably the best example. They, like, the themes are so strong that it's cheesy. Yeah. Like, they, <laughs> they shove it down your throat. It's so aggressive. They're like, remember this, nostalgia? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's, I didn't even think about that. And that's, that's probably where it got ingrained into my brain. That and Lord of the Rings. Because, like, those were the first yeah. two movies that I ever loved. Like, yeah. as a kid, Star Wars first, and then as I got a little older, like, seeing The Lord of the Rings, just from, like, my older brother showed me. And, yeah, both of those series of films have, like, the strongest themes probably of, like, any modern movies. <laughs> it's just incredible. I, I do have a question for you, Brad. Um, what are your thoughts on The Hobbit series? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> okay, I hit a I hit a tough spot. <laughs> I, it's mixed. Zero it's mixed. out of ten. Here, I don't agree with that. I, <laughs> yeah. Overall, overall, uh, if, overall, I like them because I yeah. love Lord of the Rings so much that anything I get to experience visually in Lord of the Rings, I'm probably gonna like in some degree. Uh, my main gripe, and it's a very large one, that really taints the movie is they just made up shit <laughs> like <laughs> like there is so much and they're just clearly yeah. trying to milk the cash cow but like That's there's fair. so much stuff in those films that is nothing like nowhere in the books just completely made up the pale orc yeah. made up like love triangle thing like weird love relationship with the elf and the dwarf completely made up didn't happen just like all of this shit that is made up clearly for like you know the broad appeal and like i don't know it was it was didn't 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 yeah. fancy that but I, the I, stuff no, that fair. was in alignment with the story <laughs> i enjoyed a lot I never watched okay. past the first part because I hated it so much. Oh, <laughs> it's man. It's just, I just, the story itself is really good. And I, I grew up, like, watching the, like, I, I think it was from the 70s or something. It was just a cartoon. I remember that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, would, I would watch that growing up. So, like, I knew the story really well ever since I was a little kid. But, yeah, like bringing it into live action and then having it next to Lord of the Rings to compare to. Right. It just feels very Disneyified, which I hate. That's like you're fair. really taking a a dark magical world and adding like silly humor into it. I think the Hobbit Dude, has silly humor. It was just it wasn't done tastefully in well, accordance I, with I the I guess books. what I'm saying is that it feels like it's just made for kids to me. 
Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I could understand that. Like, James, understand what are, Lord of the Rings. Purpose. What are your Even thoughts? Though I think Lord of the Rings is the best thing to show your kids. <laughs> so, I, I only saw the... I think it was... I, I can't remember which one it was. I just remember them going to, like, the dragon. So no one lair. here has actually seen all three of the Hobbit movies? No, I, I haven't seen all three. I just, I think I saw the yeah. first and the second, but I can't, <laughs> I can't really recall them. But what, to, to Eric's comment of Disney-fying things, I could not agree more on that because I feel like, obviously, Marvel's owned by Disney now and Star Wars is too. And but they I both feel suck. like They're all, they're all Disney. <laughs> they're both right? trash now. Dude, I feel like every... Disney touches is just like feel good stories which goes back to what we're talking about with music like sure there's feel good music and there's feel yeah. good movies but dude you you look at like the story of cyberpunk or even like the, the cyberpunk uh, anime adaptation called Edge Runners dude you watch that story and it hits hard like like emotionally it just hits you hard because it's like oh damn I grew really attached to this character now they're gone yeah. And, you know, like, yeah. I I feel like that almost kind of mimics life in terms of, like, it's not always going to be your Disney fairy tale, if you Yeah, will. no, yeah. life, you life know? is so much harder than that victory, and so much darker. Victory yeah. has a very heavy cost. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you're never the same after. And that's actually something that Lord of the Rings captures really well. And I was talking to my mom about this the other day. We just, like, were texting about it. The, yeah. Like, Frodo is never the same. He has to go away with the elves yeah. after. Because he's tainted yeah. by that darkness. He can't, like, yeah. live how he yeah. used to. Like, you... Yeah, people that go through immense struggle, they transform and they become someone else. And they can't go back and live the old life that they were living because they're not the same person. And that's just, like, macro Lord of the Rings. <coughs> His character arc is a great example of that. Yeah. And they, they, I mean, they just hit... They hit so many... Of the realities of life, I know. Yeah, in such a flawless way. God, I think that's so <laughs> ultimately why it stands up so much. Yeah. even twenty years later, is because they nailed like what it means to be a human with every yeah. single character, like Aragorn's arc, Boromir's arc, like everyone. You can see yourself in all of them, in the good and the bad, and you see their yeah. transformations, and it's just like this masterwork of of like being a human and trying to yeah do the best you can struggle with your fears your the darkness within you and fear of failure not, yeah fear of failing uh, fear dude, of inadequacy I'll, yeah. yeah yeah i'll say like this awful. this this last year has been like a really tough one for me because um like, you guys didn't know, but, like, when I was a kid, when, like, I remember to this day, when I was, like, in second, third grade, all I ever wanted to do in my life was, like, live in Miami, because that's what my heroes back in the day, like, Dwayne Wade and Shaquille O'Neal did, which I was, I was very much a basketball kid, because my dad played uh, back in the day. Also, but, so everyone yeah, knows so, watching, uh, Jaden is, like, six foot nine or something. Yeah, I am a giant. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, and no, he's like, very back, back in... <laughs> Hoo -hoo. <laughs> I, mean, you, I don't have to tell the audience <laughs> hey you know um yeah but no ba back in the day all i ever wanted to do was like live in miami and you know um eight years ago like i made that dream happen i got a scholarship um to to uh saint thomas university out in miami and i lived there for eight years and this last year was like a really tough year for me um which like you know i i don't mind talking about it like i obviously i got i got laid off um, I mean, this was after I moved, but I, I kind of saw the writing on the wall. And at that time, I, I felt like I did everything right to stay there. Like, you know, I, I graduated with a bachelor's degree uh, in three years. I got a master's degree in one year, which if you're 23 and you have a master's degree, that's almost like pretty much unheard of. That's, that's pretty wild. Um, and, you know, I got a job right out the gate, was making good money, but... It was just like i just couldn't sustain myself and you know that was like the bitter reality of like you know you can do everything right but sometimes it just doesn't work out and that's why like i say like yeah. those stories that do have a life uh kind of you know t touch on how life really is like i feel like the that may connect with audiences more than just a feel-good story because they feel 
some sort of like relatability to yeah, it. Yeah, because it's I real. guess if that makes like, sense. Reality is complicated and it sucks. Yeah. You know, and it can be awesome and beautiful, but like, you know, when I when I moved out to Denver, it was like. Okay, I move out to Denver. I get management, and like I move here for music, right? This is like yeah. two and a half years ago. Yeah, this is what I came over and talked to you about today, too. Yeah, yeah. Eric was talking to me about his journey, which is like mine a couple years later. But I move yeah. out to Denver. I'm like, I'm doing this music thing. Like, I don't have a lot of releases at this point. Just like maybe three or four. I'm like, yeah. I'm I'm doing it for the music. Let's make it happen. New city, don't know anyone here, move out here, uh, get management within, a, like, the week I move out here, I get management for my music project, I'm like, sick, like, God's blessing is upon me, like, I <laughs> am invincible, yeah. I, like, start getting these records signed to these labels that I've been dreaming about for, like, five years of wanting to sign songs to all these labels, I get signed to this label, sign this label, sign this label, like just winning. And then my brother dies in a car accident. And it's just like, oh, so that's life, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, man. you know, I keep doing the music thing. And then two years later, here I am. I just quit that music project. It's like life is complex and terrible things happen to all of us. And like the longer... You go down the timeline, the more, you know, the more loss that you experience and the suffering and, you know, you're not super young and strong and energetic anymore. It's like these, these negative things end up, you know, happening to all of us. And that's part of the complexity and it's not all sunshine and rainbows for any human being that's alive. Yeah, and it's like, absolutely. you know, what you do when those things happen that define you. I know it's so cheesy and cliche, but it's like, you know, going back to Lord of the Rings, it's like, you know, they got put in some, some devastating situations and it's, it's how those people reacted to those situations that defined who they became in the end. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. all are dealt different cards, different hands, go through different amounts of struggle over different periods of time. But it's like, you know, being a human that's what being a human is. It's like, yeah, it's not perfect. It's not pretty. And that's why the Disney bullshit never works. Yeah. Cause that's not reality. Absolutely. And, and to, to Eric's point, kind of like with Frodo, like, you know, he could never go back to the life he once had. And I feel like a lot of us, it's the same thing. Like we, we can't like Brad, you can't go back to Orlando and and feel the same way you did before you moved yeah, to Denver. Absolutely, um, yeah. Eric, I, I I'm sure you feel the person, same way. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I mean, me, I I feel the same way. Like I I I can't go back to Florida and be like, oh, everything's fine and sunshine and rainbows, and I'm that kid that has a little twinkle in his eye because you know he chased his dream or whatever. It's like, no, we've all been through shit. We saw soul. something and we're like, we are changed. You know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And to ignore that is to just live in an insane cycle and never get out of it, you know? It's never you never yeah. grow and progress and become the person that you're meant to be unless you face those things head on and and uh choose to to fight through them. And I think that's Which uh, ties in which ties into the EP name Break the Loop. Just kidding. I I didn't say anything. You didn't hear that. You heard it here okay. full. First, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Break the Loop EP coming out tomorrow on Exuvium Records. <laughs> Not tomorrow. Not anytime yeah. soon. Oh, God. No, we, we still got some work to do on that one. Later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but the no, demos but are sounding very, very much pretty, sick. pretty sick. But I think yeah. this is a great spot to wrap it up. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. If you're listening. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah, dude. Thanks for coming on. I think this conversation was amazing and i love all the yep. different points we we got to touch on we're excited to hear more Jaden carr on exuvium and uh yeah we'll see you guys and you next better time. not release anywhere else okay you break your contract <laughs> i won't, won't. Jaden carr I'm disappears <laughs> forever oh man it's time to play all these like gate. The... Am I going to be the whistleblower from uh from Boeing that just disappeared and nobody found him <laughs> yeah yeah, you cross Exuvium, let's just say 
you don't exist anymore. <laughs> What's your <laughs> saying? What's your say? All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks for uh, thanks All for right. watching.